We are here at the Red State Gathering with Senator Ron Johnson from the great state of Wisconsin. Uh, how are you doing today? Very good, Sarah. How about yourself? Really good, really good. Your speech got a good reception. Um, have you ever been to um, the Red State Gathering before? I have not. I've heard about it. I've, 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 I've been a subscriber and I've been reading Red State for years, but uh, I've never come to this event. It's, it's a good sign for freedom, quite honestly. This level of enthusiasm, this number of people coming is, is a good sign. Okay, now you just got elected in 2010. Um, what kind of role did bloggers and online activists play in your election? Well, you know, literally, I'm, I'm a 57-year-old guy. You know, when I ran, I guess I was 55. And, you know, you're a product of, of what you read. You know, so I've, I've read, for example, the Wall Street Journal editorial page for over 30 years. Things like uh, National Review, but with the advent of the internet, now you have media coming at you, all kinds of information, and the value I certainly find in terms of bloggers is you end up with people that can really delve into a particular issue and come up with information that the rest of us don't have. And they reveal it and it gets disseminated very quickly. And uh, it's valuable. So I think I said in, in my speech, and I think it's just true, that the greatest threat to freedom really is ignorance. And this, if we're going to win the debate, if we're going to, if we're going to reclaim the vision of this, our founding fathers, we have to inform the American public. because. You know, what's sad is far too many Americans have either forgotten, or what's even sadder, were never taught the foundational premises of this nation. You know, that this is a nation based on freedom. The government isn't there to solve your problems. It's, you know, government's necessary, but by and large, it's something to fear. Because as government grows, our freedoms recede. And, and we have got to reinstill that, that understanding in the American public. Yeah, now, um, what exactly got you interested in the idea of running? Because the 2010 race was your first run for office, right? right? Well, I've been a careful observer of the political process. Uh, I've been involved in business. Uh, I'm an accountant. I'm a plastic salesman. And uh, the, the moment, really, uh, that sparked it was the, the debate in the passage of the health care law. Uh, when, I, when I heard the president talk about the types of doctors that saved my daughter's life, saying that they're, you know, they're so greedy they'll take out a set of tonsils for a few extra bucks. Uh, that fired me up. And I gave a speech at a tea party. Uh, I told the story of my daughter who was saved with a congenital heart defect by you know, phenomenally dedicated and skilled surgeons and medical professionals. And uh, after that speech, people came up to me and said, hey, well, why don't you run? I always say that because I'm not crazy. But uh, then they passed health care law. And I, I recognize what an assault the health care law is in our freedoms. It's, it's going to lower the quality of care, it's going to lead to rationing, the innovation that saved my, my daughter's life, millions of other Americans, and not only Americans, millions around the world. I mean, it's America where, where medical miracles are created. That's all at risk. You know, by the way, it's going to bankrupt this nation. It'll be the final nail in the coffin of uh, putting this nation down financially. So that's why I stepped off the plate. Now, you defeated a, a longtime incumbent, uh, Russ Feingold. What do you think was the key to getting victory um, in, in your race? Was it, was it anger over Obamacare, or was there, was there something else that was a dynamic I would in the race? Say President Obama. And fortunately, and let, let's hope this holds true for 2012, there are enough Americans that recognize that President Obama's lack of respect for a free enterprise system, and I would say lack of respect for the individuals for the principles that made this country great, offend enough people. They realize how dangerous it is. I mean, when you take a look at the economic model that, and the path that this president's putting our nation on, uh, Brian Priebus says this all the time, you know, we know that Europe doesn't work for Europe. I mean, wh why do we want to translate that for us here? You take a look at, you know, what happened in, in Russia, in Venezuela, how about the island paradise of Cuba? I mean, the economic model that this president embraces is wrong. It's just simply wrong. And enough people recognize that in 2010. Uh, hopefully those people still come out in, uh, in a presidential year where you do get higher voter turnout. Uh, and that's really, to me, the wild card. That, that could make the difference. So we need to make sure that uh, as many people that agree with our philosophy, the philosophy of our founding fathers, that they get fired up, that they get energized, that they, they talk to their friends, family, and neighbors, they get involved and come out and vote. Okay, now you talked about being fired up. Um, when I've interviewed, um, I've interviewed a lot mem more members of the um, the House and the representatives who were elected in 2010. It seems to me there's an, a different attitude. They they are more fired up. They, they there seems to be more of a sense of urgency um, and willingness to get in the ring and fight. Um, do you see a similar dynamic in the Senate? Well, you know, I think what the difference is 
is there are far too many members of Congress that their first priority, unfortunately, really is getting reelected. The second priority would be if, if doing something for their state or district helps them get reelected, well, they're all for that. And unfortunately, America comes a distant third. I think what you saw in 2010 is a lot, there's a lot more of the members that, that stood up for, to run for office for the first time are putting America first. They, they realize the peril this nation is in, and they, they went to Washington dedicated to seeing, seeing what they could do to save America. And that, that's, a, that's, you know, again, so the priorities are totally different. America, you know, not forgetting that we serve and we, we, we represent the people in our states and our districts. I mean, that's, that's important as well. But our, 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 our re-election is either not even considered or it's extremely low priority. I mean, from my standpoint, the, probably the most uh, uh, appreciated thing I said in the campaign is I would never vote with my re-election mind. I met it and I haven't done it yet. Well, that's good. I hope we end up with more people like you. Um, now, I, one of the frustrations, I think, with the, with the House and also a lot of Republicans that have watched the um, Congress over the past year or so is the House will pass bills, and it's not even that they get voted down in the Senate, which we would expect with the Democrats controlling it. It's that they're not even allowed in the door. Yeah. They're not even discussed. Um, is, there, is there anything that the Democratic leadership is even saying to you guys about that? Are they even willing to discuss these bills that the House is sending, or they're, they're no, no, shut no, down I mean, all, since, all together? Since, uh, you know, re really, President Obama stopped running America the day after the election in 2010. He started running for re-election. And Harry Reid has been his ally in that effort, and everything they've done in the United States Senate since that point in time has been to further President, elections, or President Obama's re-election. It's just obvious. I mean, they're, they're bringing up bills that are unconstitutional. I mean, they're, they're initiating tax bills in the Senate, which the Constitution says, no, those have to start in the House. Yeah, that's useless. It's, it's, it's totally useless. Well, it's useful for President Obama's re-election campaign because he can't run on a record. His record is miserable. He's, he's made all these promises that he hasn't delivered on, cutting the deficit in half, uh, you know, cost of family plan going to decline by $2,500. Oops, sorry, it's up by over $2,500. That's a $5,000 broken promise. Uh, unemployment. You know, continues. It was never supposed to get above eight percent if we pass the stimulus. It's been 41, 42 months above eight uh, percent. But you're reading he, too he, much into the numbers. Every he, press release that they, every time the job numbers come out, the press release says, "Don't read too much into the numbers." Right. Well, I guess take a look at the economy. Only grew at one half percent. I can keep going. The fact <laughs> of the matter is, his his record is miserable. He understands it. It's indefensible. So about all they really can do is throw up these issues to try and distract. The American people. It's, it's an magician's sleight of hand. You know, pay no attention to that man behind the curtains. Check, check out, check out what we're, we're talking about over here. Uh, he'll continue to do that right up to the election, and that's why I said we have to inform the American public. We can't let him get away with it, and that, that's what's so important about uh, you know the blogging community, the social networks, you know, organizations like Red State. They're they're at the forefront of making sure that uh, the citizenry of this country are informed. Okay, great. Now, um, just to, as a, to wrap up, um, for the candidates that are running this year, what do you think is, um, what do you think are good strategies for them? What do you think is going to be the successful messaging to get Republicans elected this year? Well, take a look at what Scott Walker did in Wisconsin. You know, take a look at the power of that example where you actually had elected officials. It wasn't just Scott. It was, it was very courageous members of our state legislator as well, that they governed like they campaigned. You know, they actually acknowledged the problem and they had the, had the courage, and by the way, in Wisconsin, under repugnant levels of political intimidation, but they had the courage to actually vote, you know, make the hard decisions, take the tough votes, and they fixed the problem. And then, even better, the voters of Wisconsin, because they were forced to uh, uh, vote in that recall election, they voted and supported those, those individuals. So th that's what's required. I mean, we just need elected officials to describe the problem, lay out what their solution would be, and actually make 2012 a mandated election. I mean, to make sure that we repeal or, at a minimum, stop the implementation of Obamacare and recognize the fact that we don't have much time financially in this nation and come to Washington dedicated to address the fiscal situation, put in, put in strong spending ca caps, start limiting the size of government, start reducing it from where it is right now back to historic levels and then hopefully beyond that over time. So we can actually start get, you know, getting to the point where we stabilize our debt and deficit and, and get to a point where we start living within our means. What a concept, huh?
Okay, great. And one last question. Okay, the, the election happens and the Republicans retake the Senate and leadership comes to you and says, what should we do? If you were in charge and the Republicans have retaken the Senate, what are your priorities for next year? Well, repeal Obamacare or do whatever you can to stop its implementation, defund it, whatever. We, gotta, we have to stop the implementation of that law in its tracks first. Then, and, that, and that's part and parcel of the second priority, which is getting our debt and deficit under control. And I've always felt it's a two-step process. I mean, that's, that's why we had a proposal like cut cap and balance where you cut, which actually limits or reduces the baseline, cap statutorily. You know, so you cap the size of government in relation to the size of the economy. And then what I would prefer is a constitutional amendment that marries, that is identical to the statutory caps that provides the long-term guarantee that government will never get larger than X percent of the size of our economy. Okay, great. Well, Senator, I really appreciate you taking the time to sit with me today and enjoy the rest of the Red State Gathering. We'll enjoy it. You enjoy it, too.